hello. <laughs> so today I'm going to be interviewing Philip Beasley, architect and sculptor artist. And I'm just waiting for him to log on. And I'm going to talk to him today about his exhibition, um, Neander in Cambridge, Ontario. Here we go. Hello. Hey, Rochelle, how are you doing? <laughs> how are you? I'm doing fine. Are you in your studio? Is that why you're all messed up? Worry about my myst my man of mystery stuff. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's a couple of people here here with me, so it's a small measure to make it make it up possible, you mm -hmm. know. Mm-hmm. Better be safe than sorry. Mean meanwhile, you are in a stainless white laboratory. I see. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually in my bedroom. It has the best lighting. <laughs> well, I can tell you, my bedroom looks nothing like that. <laughs> so I admire you. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> too funny. <laughs> That's good. Well, I guess to start, because I think I'm I'm going to be putting this on on platforms that people don't know who you are. So can you let us know about you know who you are and you know what and what you do in terms of work in terms of work. So, Rochelle, I'm an artist and a researcher, um, and. I started my my work as a as a classically trained visual artist, and I worked on the stage quite a bit and in music in in, the, in those earlier periods. And with a lot of collective um, work, collect collaborations and and uh, and group group processes where 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 it really was not about one person, but but ra rather it was about, about group thinking and. That was at the tail end of the, of the 1960s and 70s, um, and then after after a period of, of visual art, I became an architect, and then I started practicing and doing some strong public work, and experimental things started continuing with with that, um, and then after after a couple of rather transformational experiences, including a wonderful year in Rome, and uh, another one in India. Um, the return was really, really renewed the sense of working, working experimentally, and the, and the current series started, which has been happening for I guess about twenty five years now. Um, but um, it went in in a succession of, of jumps as well, starting with textiles and and uh, new craft, and then digital fabrication and computational design became very strong, and then added to that. Chemistry. Now, I'm giving a rather long answer to 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 this because the layering of those different things actually has turned out to be quite uh, quite quite a happy, fertile one in creating what I do now. And 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 what I do now is work with quite a large group, collaborative group called the Living Architecture Systems Group, and we're working on a vision of what the future of architecture and the built environment could be and in fact what the, what the future of sculpture and and some kinds of art could be as well and the core idea that we've started to work with is the idea that that instead of treating things as inert and uh, just material that things can be treated increasingly like they are alive and and the the boundary be between Cold rock and mineral and 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 the elements and organisms and and living systems becomes increasingly open in in really extraordinarily in interesting ways, um, and we're working right at that boundary back and forth con constantly. That's it's not the same thing as working with um, li living tissues and all of the ethical problems of of, of, of genetics and eugenics. It's working right at the boundary in which mineral systems become plant-like and start to regenerate and start to start to grow and, and replenish. And that seems like an incredibly fertile way to, to work with sculpture and architecture. That's very beautiful. And do you, do you find that your work is almost bringing in those, those themes of inclusivity and diversity because there's so many layers and so many elements to the work that you do? The, 
the work can can be thought of as inclusive and diverse in two fundamental ways. One 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 way is to is to think of the difference between humans and other things. I mean, if 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 we look below and above, let's say, we'd be on in the ground below us and and in the sky above us. Rather than thinking of the of those realms as different, it becomes possible to say that that we are a part of a vastly di di diverse environment, and we're an integral part of it. But other things are are very very powerful and 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 very fragile too, and we have a vast kind of spectrum of impacts. So the the sense that that rock and soil, for for example, or 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 others other living species, or or the the air and and space above us is part of our, literally part of our body, is a, is a, is a really incredibly motivating part. So that's, that's one kind of inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other kind of in inclusiveness and diversity is that who we are socially be between us, rather than being taught that we're one kind of closed thing, you know, with boundaries around each, each thing, the reality that we are each really unapologetic mongrels of, of, of diverse species, like bundles of, right. of different organs and, and beings, makes the suggestion that we can really approach kind of with, with kind of a wonderful kind of humility and curiosity, the idea of, ident of identity. And, and rather than the kind of deeply unfortunate uh, trend of wall making, which is which is so beset our, our world, especially in, in in recent years, but which is a long, long tradition, really. Yeah. I mean, you could call it a a, a twenty five hundred year old colonial tradition. Yeah. Really, it's, it's in the DNA of architecture is to build walls. Mm -hmm. It is. It is, Rochelle. Um, rather than following that tradition, we could actually believe in in the sheer fertility of open thresholds and boundaries, and 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 see that as rather than focusing on vulnerability and disease and fear we could we could focus on curiosity and diversity and refreshment and fertility and and see how that makes us incredibly resilient and strong so both of those ways of thinking both both outside of humanity and also inside of humanity are really devoted to to finding sheer sustainable fertility um, and a kind of confidence. In fact, the work is quite optimistic, and at the same time, it it seems to seems to increasingly celebrate a kind of unapologetic fragility. Mm -hmm. And has COVID affected the way you work or approach your work now? I think it's a, it's it's affected the work in fundamental ways, and may, may, maybe two are the most striking. One one is that we are increasingly the the work is very complex and, mm -hmm. and it, it involves several different disciplines. I mean, advanced industrial design with with special ways of making things and and software that that is meshed and modular and can do, can can work with comp complex systems for 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 example, and and the phys the physical scaffolding. Um, so what we're doing is, is we're investing deeply in open source pattern making and, and skill sharing and, and a whole kind of expansion of publication and kits and creation kits too that allow a very deep participation both at the expert level and, and also at the, at, at, at the level of, of children and, and, and young students sharing in the work as well. There, there's some coursework going on and there, there's some particular programs that are, that are going. And that, that's been a, a very striking kind of impact uh, of, of the COVID crisis, which has turned into something very, very motivating. Mm. The, the, the other kind of impact is in symbolism and in what, what the work, work expresses. Just the, the sheer need to to find resilience and fertility has become so so acute, and in in that search for ways to express possibility, the the way the dreadful Death Star nature of the COVID virus itself 
um, has very strong common ground with some of the forms that, that we've been making in, in the sculpture. I mean, it, when, when you walk into, into the space of Meander in Tapestry Hall in Cambridge, you can see a series of great hanging, bubbling spheres above you in, in, the, in the center of, 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 of the, the main chamber with, with, me, with many, many other uh, hemispheric and, and sp spherical spiny accretions around it too. And the, the COVID virus is a cousin of those forms quite directly. Really? Huh. But at the same time, there's a really crucial difference. I mean, where, where you see the, you know, some common ground in, in the spherical cellular accretion of all of the forms. And on one hand, the, the, the COVID virus has really terrible kind of lugs on the end of all our spines. And it, it, I describe it as a death star because that's how it behaves. It, it okay. locks into the, the cell walls of, it hosts, of its hosts and then it tears away tissues when it, when it separates. So when it's got a, got a real kind of devastating um, impact on its surroundings. And in contrast, the, the, the bubbling spheres that, that are in the sculpture are very delicate kind of ghosts that, that gently reach out and caress and overlap and and relate and so there's a similarity for sure which maybe spe maybe speaks of how things could come together in the future and a kind of optimism that that you integrate that kind of form as opposed to just polarize it and make it the monster right um, we don't need more walls what we need is is to become resilient and 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 integrate and let things pass through us but in a very very careful and uh, an effective way but so I, I, fi I, I find that the the common ground of the the meaning of the work like what it symbolizes also really very motivating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I was reading that you know you were taking some of your inspiration from the Grand River so how did that influence the elements in the exhibition environment and how did you you know what did you take from there and what did you bring into into this space the name Meander uh, is taken from the lovely sinusoidal current of the Grand and, and the way it has gone through its oxbow forms, scouring and depositing and scouring deposit, depositing over the eons since, since the, the, the Wisconsin ice and, and, and likely earlier than that as well. I mean, uh, and that kind of extraordinary for fertile um, current in in which there's a there's a surging kind of mo movement of, of fertile liquid gathering its or its organic matters from the silts and and from the underlying limestones and then depositing it and continually making new landscape creates a kind of very interesting standing wave that, that is the sense that it that it's it's got a rhythm to it and it, and it, it it reaches out to the surrounding communities while at the same time it's it never stands still. I mean it's it it it's a it's a it's a remarkable dynamic form, and th those same principles are very much at the heart of of the Meander sculpture. I mean, in there there's quite a special new physics that's that's involved in the sculpture called dissipative adaptation, and that is the idea that in contrast to the ideas of the classical world in which you you kind of if to be a living system you have to fight and and treat yourself like a fort and the outside is insecure and, right. and classical physics is like that as well because the the original idea of entropy was that okay a living system has to hold itself together and be really organized Otherwise, you will fall apart, and eventually, you're going to fall apart into dust anyway. That's the second law of thermodynamics in its classical sense, and that 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 produces a kind of an, a, a a weird opposition, a, 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 not weird, a, a terribly prevalent opposition between between life and the world, mm -hmm. which has been with us certainly for twenty five hundred years in in classical paradigms. And so, in contrast to that. The idea of of, dis, of dissipation is that actually there you're you're not simply holding on to energy you're constantly having energy roll through you, 
and it forms lovely standing waves. Think of think of uh, the dunes around a beach, or, or 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 ocean waves, or perhaps the barred forms of cumulus clouds. Those are those are wonderful, pure, pure versions of that. And and in fact, that 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 uh, those examples are actually simple forms which lie all around us and make up make up all of nature. In fact, and so. The Grand River is a lovely local example, example of, of, of that same form. And the discovery of that was made by Ilya Prigogine some 70 years ago, won the Nobel Prize for it in, 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 in the 1970s. And it's been, that, that idea has been a, an incredible inspiration because it means that underlying the ethical idea that we can be open and inclusive is some hard physics that says, no, that's actually how you make something really durable. <laughs> right. Like, it continually renews itself, right? So it's like like we really mean business as well as having some some pretty strong feelings about it. Well, that's really I like that. It's all it's very poetic, being like we're just going to take the the movement of something, the feel of something, and we're going to try and recreate it in a new space for somebody else to kind of experience. So what I find interesting about uh, the work that you're talking about is that it's so complex, right? As poetic as everything is, it's all of the little pieces and parts and the way you've layered everything is very, um, is very thought through. And so how do you put together everything like in terms of do you, do you approach the work in terms of ecosystem and then environment or do you approach it in terms of materiality and, and, and how they speak to each other, right? Because it's, there's a lot of parts that you have working with each other. So I would love to know that process in terms of putting that puzzle together. The, the analogies of ecosystem and environment are really strong as, as well as classes of materials. I mean, it's, it, it is quite true that the work is complex and it doesn't, it, it doesn't uh, nearly approach the, the, the un, almost unthinkable complexity of a, of a living organism in nature, but, but, it, but it does have a certain amount of complexity. What, what happens is that there are original patterns, which are in fact very simple, kind of think, think of something as simple as a molecule, you know, mm -hmm. or, or let's say a tile, which has just a certain number of, it, of attachments with it, and, and a certain number of ways they could fasten it. Started with like primary geometry of a, right. of a, tri a triangle or, a, or, or a pentagon or a hexagon, for example. And then those things are formed in rather special ways. So that, so that skeletal, skeletons reach to each of the attachment points and very efficient kind of light, light, lightweight structures are, are made out of those. And then those are multiplied very, very strongly in, mm. In, in, in the, that by the thousands or maybe even the ten, ten thousands. And then because of their simplicity and their lightness, they're able to combine in a, in a whole kind of pattern language of, of families of, of different clusters. And then those compound on top of the, uh, on, on top of those, those basic organizations. And it produces a, a, a kind of a very satisfying fertility of many, many different configurations, but they're all harmonized in fundamental ways so that even though they're different, they can still fit together. Now that's a structural kit that I'm just describing. Okay. And you could think of that as similar to the way that, that a living organism has cells. Okay. That multiply and that make tissues. That would be a good, a good, a good analogy. On top of that, there's a nervous system, which which is composed of arterials and branches and 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 nodes of of small microprocessors, which are all interconnected as well. And they have a similar kind of organization in the sense that rather than trying to make one grand central tree, you know, like the supercomputer that, that can do everything. Mm -hmm. They're distributed in many, many modules that then can talk to each other and recognize each other and, and, and work in, in quite diverse kind of crowd dynamics. And that produces an, another kind of very in, interesting organization. So there's a structural organization and then there's also a control organization. And then that in turn is is uh, 
uh, has, has a kind of a, a dressing and expansion through through many many glass vessels holding liquids and then kinetic mechanisms that that, that move and and, sh and shift and then and and then uh, frond like covers that filter and and that make membranes and each each of those makes its own system that has something of the kind of diversity of the very simplest kinds of periodic tables of elements where, where, where you have a kit of parts, they're quite, quite carefully made, but then they can expand and multiply. Now, I've just described a formal composition system. Right. But what I haven't described is just the, the human effort of, yes. of, of, making, of making and putting it together. And if you think of the kind of like the, the, the lovely energy of a quilting circle or, okay. or maybe in, in my earlier generation of, of uh, a group of a family getting together to preserve vegetables for the winter or, okay. or, yes. <laughs> you know, um, or, 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 or make, 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 making jam or something like that. I mean, like, like the kind of the, the organized, rep, re, organized repetitive acts that are very pleasurable and that and where 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 things can be very simple but they can build up into great collective complexity so that that's a that's a very important part of how we make this work we have community workshops and and we cooperate together and we manufacture things so it it occupies a kind of of human industry that stands quite in between mass mechanical construction but also, it's not. It's it's something larger and more intense than 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 the work of an individual. Let's say painting or drawing or 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 or, or, or writing a book. That 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 middle zone in between those in between between those places is a very very interesting way to work, and it it really speaks of, I think, an experience that that might be important for the future. That is the sense of collective work of right. what we share. Of the way the way communities can work together, and maybe it's an entry into some some rather difficult conversations about whether countries and provinces and nations can really mean important things to us these days, and then how how global media also has has a, has affected those kind of conversations. Mm -hmm. I'd like to think that these these kind of projects are very very motivating. Kind of co commun community think tanks and com community make, make making projects that that that, that offer some some very very happy experiences in them. So how long how long does it take? Like how long did um, your exhibition take to to create? If there's so much craft and then so much technology added and then the installation component, like it's almost like um, how do you know when it's done? Right? Because there's so many <laughs> different pieces and then when it's up, how do you know that it's all going to work because of all of the computational elements? <laughs> and then <laughs> that's a great that's a great question. And let me let me go through through those those three questions about how how you make it work and how you, how you know it's done and then how long it took. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, Meander took took uh, about a year and a half to make to make and and create maybe maybe about two years. Um, we we started with several months of rather intensive design using digital prototyping and 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 making of samples and then then we made large patches in the studio and, and hung them up and, and start started engineering them and we deliberately destroyed some things and found out how that how they were fragile and how we, how they could be durable and we kind of practiced way, ways of, of, of putting them together then then Using very small industry, uh, a farm of printers and 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 a, and a few laser cutters and some thermal forming, using very small ovens and stretching jigs, we we manufactured the elements. And, oh, really? And, okay. Yeah, and and then we and then we spent about four months building um, Meander, start, starting in the fall a, a year ago. Um, and uh, of course, the pandemic has has, has affected that. Um, but that that involved great harps of, of of hanging cords, 
fitted in into the, the the beautiful industrial hall of the of the the original textile mill, and and then setting up scaffolding, and then setting up main arterials uh, of, of 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 wiring in the trunks, and then and then laying in the mechanisms and 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 the glass, uh, and then programming it with the uh, with with software routines and and the and the sound and 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 lighting that you can now see. Um, the thing, the work is open-ended, and at the same time it has a very strong, rather balanced, organic composition that that is very carefully worked out in digital modeling. And so, so we invest quite heavily in digital simulation as well as model physical models and prototyping. And so the composition is complete, um, and. If we were to freeze it in time and and with, with without any kind of human events happening, then it would be just like like a piece of frozen music where every right. single thing is specified. Like and there there are hundreds of pages of drawings um, and models that that have been rather carefully done. However, it's designed as an open system, and so by having the possibility grid of all the hanging points like a harp. And by the by by the elements able to support each other just the way the same way cells uh, multiply in a tissue, for example, in a living organism, it becomes possible to to look and stand back and explore and and all of the the, the, diff the different primary team members are very strongly invested in how it can be as well as what it should be, and so that means that we do a myriad of of, of adjustments. And and small tucks and folds, very very much the way, say, a fashion designer would would carefully adjust a dress right. in or in order to give it a kind of harmony. And some of those adjustments are very very minor, but they seem to make a world difference. Just in the same way, you know what you know the difference of just a little bit shift in your posture. My mother would tell me to stand up straight, and and maybe maybe that's a a, a bad example, but but I think you know what I mean about. Mm -hmm. about power of those. So I, I love the sense that it's an open system while at the same time we've, we've become pretty good at being able to kind of manage the energy so that it's not too much of a monster. It's more, more just like okay. a, a pleasurable, in, intense, intense race that's open. How do we, how do we uh, know that it works is, <laughs> is, is the other question. And we know it works by intense cycles of testing. Okay. Um, and in the design process, we deliberately go past the limits. Like we we break things. Gotcha. <laughs> and, and it's it's made us it's made us pretty confident in making resilient things. Okay. In fact, this is really a kind of an essay in resilience. Um, and I guess an example would be you know back to the Grand River. We have two very different examples of how to handle a flood. You know, we we have the, the huge armored flood walls through the center of mm -hmm. Gulf, and then we have the glorious wetlands that ex that extend extend northward. Uh, uh, for example, to he Hespler or or in in the Rare Conservancy. Those are examples of of of, of lo local areas of the Grand River, anyway. And I have great respect for the, for the, the the intense responsible technicians that built the flood walls but i disagree with them i disagree with them because they intensify the impact of the flood the breakup in 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 the spring they they create extraordinary turbulence downriver they they concentrate the river and they make it much more dangerous and right. and they absolutely strip away the life that's that's around it and if i compare that to the to the the wetlands um, that are in the rare conservatory, then thousands and thousands of individual tendrils of of quite tough materials, roots and sedges and so on, dampen and work with the flood, and they and they they work together, and they make formidably powerful and and, re and resilient kind of structures. And um, so, to to my mind, that's that offers an incredibly important lesson. Uh, for how we can make buildings in the future. Mm -hmm. Living is an open system rather than something that insists on resisting everything and staying exactly the way it is. Very true, very true.
Now, there's a host of problems in what I'm saying, but, but, it, but it does, at, at the same time, I mean, there's very good reasons to do a flood wall, you know, mm -hmm. with great respect, but at the same time, I, it's, it seems very important for us to move beyond simplistic wall making. True, <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> so there, was, there was a term that was describing your approach was organic, organicism. 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 So how is that different from biomimicry? Are they similar or? Biomimicry and organicism are, are two related terms and both okay. of them are really interesting to my mind. Um, I mean, bi biomimicry is the practice of learning from nature and then imitating its processes and, and integrating those in new ways of designing. And that's the, the idea that nature is, is the teacher yes. um, is is just a kind of an inexhaustible tradition i think that uh, that that every designer in in certain ways has has learned even even the minimalists of say apple design or or the the own school still somehow find a kind of like incredible elegance that that, that nature knows as as well so that's a that's a particular design practice organicism is is perhaps the underlying movement which would say that living systems and okay. and the sense of life is is some is a fundamental inspiration um, and that that results in paradigms of how things can be harmonized what makes sense what kind of relationship there is in the world it's a it's a very very broad um, and uh, arguably eternal part of, of, of human thinking and human culture. Mm. It's the bigger system. It's like the much more bigger system than breaking it down to the most simplistic of a system. Mm. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I like how you put it. I agree with that. So I guess, you know, your concept of high tech and high touch is very poetic in, your, in, in the work that you do. And it's also like this, you utopian view of the world right like what the future could be in terms of architecture and that you know there's this um, participation of community and that nature and everything is is it's not dominant they're working together so you know when when i go visit the the space what should i be looking for or how, how should i experience or what are the types of things that i should be um, conscious of when i go through it i love the way you just put that michelle um Ut utopia is a difficult word, word, um, and I, I hope it. I hope maybe we can spell it E U T O P A <laughs> right. rather than U T O P A because, yeah. because maybe that would be a way of reclaiming its earlier meaning. Today, it's got a very negative meaning, as if it's just uh, uh, f foolish and obsessive and 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 uh, probably a cult, you know, and, <laughs> right. you know, this way. But, but the earlier term means beautiful topography. E E U, you know, is, mm -hmm. is a kind of kind of beauty, and 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 the idea that that this world could be a vision of where we could go and of possibility is what I hope of a, a, a visitor who who goes into the the hall, of the, the tapestry hall, and visits me and would see, um, and so that that kind of vision. I think unapologetically would be utopian, at least if we if we if we miss if we misspell it. <laughs> so so that it's not automatically foolish anyway. Right. So it's hopeful. So if we if we walk in the the north or south entries, then then you'll you'll be in in the space a soaring space about about sixty feet high. Of of the eighteen hundreds, uh, lovely basilica form of the, of of, of the, lo the the long hall, which stood on the banks of the Grand River when it was part of a, of a bustling eighteen hundreds town in the Industrial Revolution, and now that's been converted into into a lovely event hall at at, at the heart of of Hip's new residential development. That developed in quite visionary ways by by Scott Higgins, where 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 the idea of public space is really woven woven into the heart of the development and, and integrated with Cambridge. And as you go in 
in those doors, you'll see hanging above you a great bubbling cluster of, of uh, expanded um, transparent polymer and, and stainless steel forms encrusted with glass vessels that hold fluids with lights coming through them that, that make, make a whole bubbling forest of lenses that, that gather, gather an amount of a huge amount of kind of gl glistening light. And there will be little rustling vibration and, and shift, shifting patterns of, of, of lights coming from the many hundreds of digitally controlled elements, um, uh, digitally, digitally controlled little vibrating mechanisms resulting in, in fluttering fronds and, and, and lights with, within the, the vessels. And the, the vessels have rather special ingredients. They have protocell ingredients, which are mm. prototype cells, pri primary, primary minerals that are, that are modeling how living cells might, might work. And so hanging in the center, we are flanked by a couple of river-like skeletal canopies that, that reach, that are also encrusted with, with mechanisms and, and sensors and speakers. And then floating off into the distance is a billowing cloud as well with, with higher, higher level. And you can walk to the, to the upper levels and explore it um, and uh, make gentle gestures and the sculpture will respond back to you with, with, with stro stroking and, vi and vibrating um, and, and ripples of light. And, and if, you, if you make certain gestures, then, it, then it, will, it will react playfully in sound as well. Um, echoing through the space, and and uh, you can coax it into a, a lot of very 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 active response, or else it'll settle down, and then it then it can also just be a very uh, very very quiet kind of contemplation, a little bit like looking at a, at let's say a, a quiet pond in a in a forest, just as the light fades. Oh, that's so nice. It's almost like. Um... The work is is doing the exact opposite of what the pandemic is doing. It's actually encouraging interaction and touch and different ways of exploring a space than just the barriers of what of what we're we're used to. Well, that's nice. Mm -hmm. So I think just to you know close everything out. Is there anything else you would like to say for the next generation of architects and designers? I think I think the idea that something very very simple can be very very carefully multiplied and then can can result in in very substantial kind of transformations of the environment is something that that I've come to believe and the difference between acting locally and and with great intimacy uh, and and care and then the consequence of really making a difference in the entire world is it might sound like a riddle but i think that through sheer involvement like like be being very involved in 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 the way that perhaps meander demonstrates can give a, a kind of of optimism it can, it, it can mean that a, that a kind of an optimism of being deeply involved in the world is is justified that very very substantial and, and resilient things become become possible by by using some contemporary technologies with care and then just by, by through the sheer involvement of working with our hands and and working in cooperation mm, beautiful so I, I hope i hope it's I, I i hope that the message will be one of hope and 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 curiosity and and that it can be very motivating mm. Well, I can't wait to experience it. And is there anything that we can expect for you in 2021? Um, we are we are quite busy in the studio, Rochelle. We're we're oh, going to be mounting uh, quite a, a generous new environment in uh, at the Venice Biennale. Ah, oh, that's exciting! In, in May of 2021, and that involves a, a a work called Grove, which which involves a. a densely immersive forest and also a pool which which has a, a very special film project projected and, and, and beaming out of it um, done done with some some very special collaborating artists um, 
and and so so we we hope that it will be a, a special news story that that really resonates and builds off of the of the story of Meander. Oh, nice. And and we hope that we'll we'll find ways to to bring that installation and story back home to Canada. Oh, after. beautiful. <laughs> Very beautiful. <laughs> well, I can't wait. Uh, I can't wait to see that. Um, you know, either in person or virtually or whoever we're going to experience biennales in the future. But that's exciting to to see and to look sure. forward to. Very happy to share those images with you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I think I don't have any other any other questions unless you have any other stuff you wanted to say before we close out. But you know, this was great, very inspiring as you know, I close out the year personally. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for doing this work. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. So happy holidays and happy new year. Okay, all the best. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye.